Okay, so there are many models. All of them claim to be successful, and there must be a reason why those models are all successful. And they actually, so the one explanation I have is hidden in this slide. Well, I will come back and explain why it is relevant to successful agent feedback model, and don't look at prices. The, the message is not in prices, it's in something else. But uh, Florent suggested that we should have a just short introduction to clusters in general. Here is my introduction. So we know in our universe many gravitationally bound systems which are sort of quasi-stationary, right? You see, on the left side, this is solar system, quasi-stationary with the mass of the order of one solar mass, of course, and there are many such systems in the universe. Then there are global clusters, say 10 to the 5 solar masses, still kind of in quasi-equilibrium, virilized, right? And uh, so there are experts here who can explain the whole dynamics of them. Then there are spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, there are a few of them, and finally there are very massive clusters, and if you just uh, consider the most massive clusters, say, 10 to the 15 solar masses, then there are only about 50 such objects in observable universe, right? And so that it's clear that the, the clusters are the most massive realized objects in our universe. Then we can say that the number of clusters is extremely sensitive to cosmological parameters. They also are giant plasma laboratories and special plasma weakly collisional magnetized, so that uh, in this plasma, mean free pass, Coulomb mean free pass, is typically uh, 12 orders of magnitude larger than the Larmor radius of particles. And those clusters also offer a possibility to test uh, the uh, uh, kind of interaction between supermassive black holes and the gas in very detail. Now let's just kind of, I want to slightly justify those statements. The first question, and why are there so few clusters in our universe? And this is entirely set by cosmology. What is shown here in this plot is the wave number in inverse megaparsecs. So this is small scales, this is large scales, and so the objects, uh, the mass of the object is also grows in this direction. This sm small object, this is massive object, clusters somewhere here. And here is the typical amplitude uh, of de matter density fluctuations in our universe. Delta rho rho, the RMS of density fluctuations. And at redshift 1000, from which we see CMB, that's the same picture as you see on the ceiling uh, in the foyer, this is Planck map, we know what is the amplitude of density fluctuation. This, this thing is just directly from CMB map, this curve, and it depends on the scale. For massive object, amplitude is small, for just small object, amplitude is large. It's large, but not large enough. So here at redshift 1000, it's less than 1%. And this means that the universe is almost uniform. And in order to overcome Hubble expansion and create virilized objects, this, the overdensity or just local density in the object should be something like twice larger than the mean density of the universe. Then the object will start collapsing. And if a typical amplitude is less than 1%, it's extremely difficult to find the object which will be twice denser than the mean density of the universe, right? This is at redshift 1000, nothing, so there are no objects there. But as the universe evolves and expands, the kind of all small linear perturbations grow, and so that at redshift hundred, they're already just at the level of uh, small scales of the order of 10%. At, at the redshift zero, this is green curve, they're already exceeding kind of typical amplitude of fluctuation on small scale, already exceeding unity. So, but this is of course linear theory, but once the, there are many objects which are just uh, twice denser than the mean universe, they start forming realized objects. And so that's why at redshift, say, 10 or 20, first stars, first galaxies appear. And uh, you can see that at small scale, the amplitude is large, and clusters are somewhere there. That clusters, even at redshift zero, there are still on those scales, 10 megaparsec or so, the amplification is so small that it's only very peculiar fluctuation can reach the limit required to form a cluster. Right? It's like, like this, so that you, know, you have to exceed 
the level of the clouds, and only once in a while you can find the object which has at scales of clusters at 10 megaparsec, which exceeds this level. That's why there are only few objects, few cl massive clusters, uh, much less than these smaller scale objects. Another point is why the uh, number of clusters is extremely sensitive to uh, cosmology. This is illustrated here. Uh, this is a scale factor, which is related to the redshift, and this is the amplitude of perturbation, the, the same amplitude I was talking about. And in the matter-dominated universe, the, this amplitude is simply proportional to this scale factor. So there is a straight line up to one. It's normalized to one. And in the universe with dark energy, you see that because of accelerated expansion, the amplitude doesn't grow as fast of perturbation, doesn't grow as fast as in the matter-dominated universe. And in the redshift one, you see that there is a typical amplitude is, say, 20-25% lower in the universe with dark energy than uh, with the matter-dominated universe. Well, it's only 25%, right? Small. But this small variation is actually, is actually hidden here, right? And th the whole factor is extremely large. And so when you change this by a small factor, there is huge changes. And this is shown in this diagram. This is now the mass function, the abundance of uh, massive objects at the function of the mass. So these are rich clusters, this is smaller clusters, this is groups, uh, galaxies. And you see that there are three curves which correspond to different amplitude. 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.6. Well, this is, say, 30% difference. But the number of massive clusters changes by many orders of magnitude. It's just because they are just so rare. So this thing is so small so that any tiny variation to this thing cause enormous variation in this number. That's why just studying, just counting massive clusters, you can kind of uh, determine the uh, this, for example, this parameter, the amplitude of perturbation, and then infer, for example, properties of dark energy. Another one, so that we know that clusters are X-ray, well, uh, they are deep potential wells which are formed, and the depth of these potential wells is also entirely set by cosmology. Again, we can use the Planck map, and we, we can just infer the just amplitude of variations of potential on large scales just from temperature variations, like this, right? And this is just really the depths of potential wells on the largest scale. And if you multiply this uh, depths of the potential well by the proton mass times, say, uh, 0.5 hydrogen, uh, so electron and proton, we will get the temperature something like 15 keV, right? And this corresponds, well, this is actually a wave number, and this is the depths of the potential in the kiloelectron volts, and in the harrison zeldovich spectrum, that would be flat line. All objects would have the same depths, 15 kilo electron volt, and our galaxy would be just X-ray emitting galaxy, but, well, because of the sealed damping, well, the kind of, uh, uh, the amplitude of the potential drops on small scales, so the, the galaxies are somewhere here, but on the cluster scales, there are still X-ray temperatures. So the depth of the potential well suggests that any proton which is falling into the cluster potential well should accelerate to the energy which corresponds to the uh, several kiloelectron volts. Right. Okay. So this means that kind of from this kind of simple picture, we uh, can expect the clusters to be kind of. Uh, uh, composed in our universe from the dark matter, which we can't see but we can simulate, from stars, which we can see, and also from the hot gas, which is not confined to stars. And this hot gas should be X-ray emitting. And because the potential well is so deep, usually people say that everything what falls in cannot escape, and therefore the, the ratio between the barons to the dark matter in the whole universe this fraction should be roughly the same in the whole universe and in clusters. And this is very useful also cosmological test for clusters. You count stars, you count X-ray emitting gas, which actually dominant baron fraction. And uh, from the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, you determine the mass, which is mostly dark matter. You divide 
gas plus stars by dark matter, and you get the uh, just uh, the ratio of the baryons to dark matter in our universe just from simple observations. Okay, so then the typical cluster in optical in X-ray band looks like this. This is Perseus cluster. This is roughly one megaparsec cross. This is optical image. Well. This is Perseus cluster, this is central galaxy NGC 1275, famous object in, across all wave bands. And there are many other galaxies, right? And yeah, uh, typically in the relaxed cluster, the most massive galaxy is sitting right in the center, right? And this is X-ray image of the same cluster. The X-ray gas fills the potential well, it gets shock heated, compressed, and then it starts emitting X-rays. And just measuring the spectra, we know that this is basically a uh, thermal emission of the roughly 100 million degree gas, maybe slightly less than this cluster. And we see all the features of the optically thin thermal Bremsstrahlung plus lines which are of ions which are characteristic for this temperature. So we know this very well. Okay, once we know the, that the kind of the that the emission is a Bramstrahlung with lines, we can determine the density and temperature of this gas. This is now central part of the previous image, this is X-ray image, right? We can determine uh, density directly from the flux because we know the <coughs> emissivity of the Bramstrahlung, therefore we can just determine integrated square of the density of the line of sight. And we also from spectra we can measure temperature, right? Now we know density and temperature, then we can make simple uh, uh, calculation by dividing the so energy density per cubic centimeter by the radiative energy losses per same cubic centimeter. Here's n is the density of particles, this is the temperature, this is, uh, well, Bremsstrahlung emissivity proportional to the square of the density, and this is cooling function which is known. And this kind of cooling time, so this is the time needed for the gas to lose its thermal energy, is much shorter than the Hubble time, say 20 times shorter. And kind of then the gas in the center clearly loses energy by radiation, and then it should cool, and it should form stars, etc., 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 right? But actually, so when we check the observation more carefully, we see that this doesn't happen. So the gas is clearly losing energy because we see this X-ray emission, no question. We see X-ray photons, that luminosity, but the gas doesn't cool below just uh, key V temperatures. And the question is why? Uh, there must be a source of energy that compensate gas cooling losses, or somehow this cooling is hidden, right? That's the old problem. And this eventually led to the agent feedback concept. And the development was just over a number of years. Uh, in 60s and early 70s, it was, became clear that the X-ray emission from clusters is just thermal Bramstrahlung. In 73, that was realized that the cooling time is short. Then a few years later, the cooling flow paradig paradigm was developed, which means that the gas cools at the center, the pressure drops, outer layers compress the gas, and everything slowly flows toward the center, right? But then it was clear that observations contradict this simple picture because the kind of the cooling rate is something like in rich clusters, something like 1,000 solar masses per year. And if that much gas is cooling, it's difficult to hide it, right? And then eventually, around uh, year 2000, it, was, it became clear that the supermassive black holes at the center of clusters can actually compensate uh, cooling losses of the gas. And I'm going to talk about this topic. And since then, there are just, by now, there are something like 4,000 papers with the words AGN feedback in the abstract. And, but most of those papers are actually talking about AGN feedback in galaxies. Well, but clusters are much simpler, so we stay with clusters. Early signs that there is clear interaction between the supermassive black hole sitting at the center of the central galaxy and the gas were just uh, clear already from the comparison of the X-ray images, which is the color image here, with the radio emission maps. Here again, 1275, the same object, the very central part of the same Perseus cluster which I showed you before. Here is a supermassive black hole. Those uh, black lines are contours of synchrotron radio emission, jets and outflows produced by a supermassive black hole, and this is X-ray emitting gas. And you see that there are just kind of cavities 
there, which means that the kind of those outflows are able to displace thermal gas. So there are more radio from here, but less X-rays. But well, that was clear, and kind of the how much energy is in those slopes you can easily estimate by just calculating PV, right? Uh, so the thermal energy inside, say. But because it was just really tiny region in the central part, there was uh, immediately recognized that uh, there is huge powers associated with those slopes. But look, what is happening? So this is a central galaxy. This is a galaxy sitting right in, at the bottom of the potential well of the cluster. The atmosphere is stratified. So the, the whole picture looks like this. You have supermassive black hole somewhere here. This is potential well filled with the gas. And now you create these uh, Aegean uh, bubbles of plasma filled with relativistic particle, essentially massless. And what those bubbles are going to do? Those bubbles are going to rise just because of buoyancy, right? And now the question is, can you just uh, estimate immediately from this picture the power which the agent puts into those bubbles? And the answer is yes. And for this, you can just watch this movie, which is actually NASA's experiment of boiling water on the Earth and uh, in space, right? This is on the Earth. This is in space, exactly the same heater. It's actually not water, but some other just fluid, uh, which can actually boil at lower temperatures. Here, what is happening? Same power. Once you create a bubble, buoyancy force pulls it up, right? And you can't form big bubble, because the buoyancy is so strong that it immediately just uh, take bubble away. Here. You keep releasing energy and the bubble grow and grow because there is no buoyancy, right? So that here you can just, uh, just looking at those pictures, you can determine the gravity, the strength of the gravity, if you know the power. In clusters, we know the gravity and therefore we can determine power because the size of the forming bubbles are actually set by the competition of the buoyancy force and the power of uh, the Aegean. If the Aegean is more powerful, it'll create larger bubble before buoyancy can take it away. If it's small, like just from cigarette, those, there are a few smokers, might be known by those days, but th those experiments you can do with a cigarette and see that the, kind of the bubbles are small. With the just factory pipe, you see that they're large, right? And from this simple scaling, you can derive uh, simple estimates. And it was just, well, I'm just celebrating. There was 20 years ago, we just, uh, based on uh, those uh, kind of arguments, uh, suggested that the buoyancy is actually allow you to estimate the power of AGN. And it happened that the power is of the order of 10 to the 45 Earths per second, which means that it's fully sufficient to actually uh, compensate uh, gas cooling losses. Right? And it was really difficult. It took almost one year to go through the referee with, with this. But, but it was just the concept was suggested before Chandra was launched. But the paper was accepted only after the Chandra was launched and showed actually the same thing in many objects. But the idea is kind of simple. You look at the size of the bubbles. You just compare the buoyancy force with the uh, uh, the expansion, well, the buoyancy velocity, say, with the uh, expansion rate uh, due to the AGN, and now you get the, uh, the estimate of the AGN mechanical power. Okay, so that, well, then the, the AGN feedback model actually says that the AGNs can and do provide enough energy. The fact that they can, it's clear just by, because at the center of the cluster, there are most massive elliptical galaxies, which means that they host in the most massive black holes. And for the black hole with one billion solar masses, the Eddington power would be something like 10 to 47 Earths per second. This is more than the ex entire X-ray luminosity of the cluster, right? Well, this is they can, but also this uh, can kind of analysis of sizes of bubbles show that they not only can, they actually do. And the agent power derived from bubbles is actually comparable to the X-ray cooling losses of the gas. That's fine. Okay. 
So then we know where the energy of those supermassive black hole comes from. If we ignore rotation energy, just assuming pure uh, gravitational energy of accretion, we have accretion rate times c squared times the f, which is the value less than one, which says how much uh, energy of the accretion rest mass can be released uh, into the gas. And the minimum successful model which just explain the uh, 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 agent feedback uh, uh, paradigm is saying that the heating is actually this term, the amount of energy released by agent times the coupling constant of the released energy with the gas, and this value should be larger than the X-ray cooling losses. Now, what you can do, you can determine M dot here, multiply by the Hubble time, and then you get the, the mass of the black hole in order to provide feedback for, say, Hubble time, has to be of the order of 2 billion solar masses for the X-ray cooling losses of the order of 10 to 45 ergs per second, and for the product of those two constants, which are less than kind of unity, uh, 0.1, right? And in order to stay roughly within this number, you, you need to have extremely, well, maybe you can allow 10 to the 10 solar masses black holes, but anyway, you need very high efficiency. If you have small efficiency, you will have to grow huge black hole before it's able to compensate cooling losses, right? That's the problem, right? Unless you find the way to make the efficiency high. There are many, in principle, many problems with the whole concept. This is how the gas gets to the black hole, what is the physics of accretion, in what form the energy and momentum are released, what fraction of energy is dissipated and how, and does the gas cool or just, it just recycled. And I will just talk about those two. And the central question for me would be the efficiency of uh, coupling between the uh, energy released by AGN and the gas. And here is our energy release menu. There are various options suggested by different people and you can choose any combination of those things. For example, you can choose that the energy is released in the form of radiation or mechanical, the rare but powerful outburst or quasi-continuous. You can inject hot thermal plasma or relativistic particles, collimated high momentum, isotropic low momentum, cosmic rays uh, mixed with the uh, gas, or cosmic rays confined to the bubbles, and etc. So that any combination in principle has been suggested and used. Well, my favorite is this part, the combination of those, but you, you can choose yours, and there are many of them. And that's kind of the landscape of different models. So on this side, this is AGN, which can provide power, and now we want this power to end up as the heating of the gas. And in between, there is a mass, right? And so, for example, the, the AGN can release the energy in the form of radiation. That's fine, but the clusters are almost completely ionized. They're optically thin. The Thomson optical depth is 10 to minus 3, or at most 10 to minus 2. And the Compton temperature of the radiation of AGN is small, actually, so that we can say that this route will actually will not end up here. This energy will escape from the system in clusters and be lost. In galaxies, there might be a different story because there might be neutral gas which absorbs into our radiation. By cluster, we are losing all this energy, so it's not good. So the efficiency is low. Now, if the energy is released in the mechanical form, relativistic particles or thermal plasma, then the, there are many more options. For example, you can release the energy in the form of thermal plasma. This is just outflow of very hot plasma. Then this hot plasma will mix with the cooling plasma in the gas. And you're done, because you just immediately share the entropy which you inject with the large masses of gas. So you have immediately a very efficient heating with the efficiency of 100%. That's with thermal plasma. You can now, uh, instead of thermal plasma, you can uh, inject, for example, relativistic particles. You inject relativistic particles, even if you mix relativistic particles with thermal plasma, the coupling, the Coulomb coupling between the uh, relativistic particles and thermal particles is not high, right? It takes too long before the energy is transferred from uh, kind of relativistic particles to thermal plasma. And therefore, you don't, uh, the mixing doesn't help, but you have various options. For example, if you release this energy in form of relativistic particles very fast, 
you will produce explosions. The, this explosion will drive shocks. Those shocks will shock heat the gas, increase its entropy, and produce a, a lot of uh, hot thermal plasma now, which is again mixing with the rest of the plasma, and you again get heating. Or you can release uh, this cosmic ray slowly, quasi stationary. Then you inflate bubbles, absolutely no heating, right? It's like inflating balloon in this audience, no heating. But later, this energy can be transferred to either waves or in turbulence and eventually go to heat. Or you just mix again cosmic rays with the plasma and then they can diffuse. If they diffuse, they can just some energy can be lost or they can stream through the plasma and then they can excite a lot of instabilities which eventually lead to heat. I mean, you can spend hours discussing this diagram, but the point which I'd like to make is actually if you analyze all this sequence, almost no matter which route you choose, the coupling efficiency is close to 100%. Whatever you do, you just end up with 100% efficiency. Well, well, maybe it's 70%, who cares? It's just of the order of unity. And if you choose this route, you're actually very inefficient. So the, the statement which I'd like to make that, so all radiation is actually lost from the core and all mechanical energy, no matter of the physical details, is dissipated within the core with efficiency of 100%. And these statements are approximately valid for clusters and they're almost uh, model independent. We know there are a few exceptions, but so that we can discuss them, but this is really exceptions and I don't think that they are relevant. Okay, now uh, this is, I'm coming back to Amazon slide and you see that here is, they're saying for the vacuum cleaner energy class A. Here for a uh, uh, wash machine they say NG class A plus plus plus, and here is the NG class A. They do care, the, the manufacturer do care to put A with a lot of plus in there. But for the heater, no one actually quotes the efficiency. Do you know why? Because it's by definition 100%. No matter who is just producing the heater, it's you plug it into the outlet, all they just erg it gets from the outlet is going to be dissipated. They might be convenient, safer, etc., but they are all 100% efficient. That's the same thing is, that's why this is relevant for clusters, actually. The simplified picture of the agent feedback looks like this. So if you just release energy in the form of radiation, this energy is lost. If you do mechanical feedback, that almost no matter what you do, the, all this energy is going to be dissipated. Okay, so that's, that's kind of simple picture. This explains that if you suggest something here, you are almost guaranteed to be successful in at least uh, one zone model where you have to compensate energy losses. But it doesn't mean that you should stop doing the feedback model. You should really try to identify physical mechanism exactly how the energy flows. My favorite route is this one. This is the most peaceful route. No shocks, nothing, so that I'm going to discuss a little bit this route so that energy is released uh, in the form of fluidity particles and eventually ending up with the heat. Okay, so, and because my solution is uh, the most peaceful one, this is how it happens. Again, you have supermassive black hole which slowly inflates a bubble, so just like balloon inflated here, and there is no heating associated with it, it just it displaces the gas. Or if you want, it just uplifts the rest of the gas. I'm, when I'm inflating balloon here, the whole atmosphere is moving slightly up. That's, that's it. Right? So you put all the energy uh, into these bubbles, and the, the, well, the, the best is to associate the, the, this energy you put in with the enthalpy. So one term is the thermal energy inside the bubble, and this term is the, the PV work is actually you are doing when expanding the bubble, right? That's very simple, and that's equal to the total energy you put in. Now, if it's relativistic particles inside, the mass is zero, essentially, right? And now you have the bubble, the buoyancy force acts, pulls it up, right? The mass is zero, which means that it will be accelerated to the infinite velocity, in one second, uh, this doesn't happen because there is friction from the gas, right? Even the massless thing, if you try to just uh, drag it through the gas, there's going to be friction. 
And because the mass is zero, the, the drug has to be equal exactly the buoyancy force, right? Otherwise, it will still be accelerated. And so that the buoyancy plus drag should be zero, approximately, of course. And this means that when the uh, bubble rises, kind of the, the same force uh, of by magnitude is acting on the gas, which means that the, all the potential energy which was stored in the bubble is going to be transferred to the gas once the, the, kind of the bubble crosses one or two pressure scale heights. It's very simple, and so that uh, uh, kind of uh, you can say that the uh, the energy is paid off across in pressure scale heights, and the energy conservation guarantees that all this energy goes to the gas. And what is actually dissipated is actually PV part. So as the bu uh, the bubble rises, it expands, it converts some of its thermal energy into PV, and this PV is actually dissipated on each steps. If you are interested. Well, this just general concept, well, this is valid, no matter what the physics behind the drug, but we want to know, uh, actually, what is the uh, physical origin of this drug. And you can just in generically say that it, uh, the buoyancy acts here, the drug is here, you can represent the drug as a sum of many different forces, for example, viscosity, well, generation of turbulence, magnetic stresses, potential energy of uplifted gas, excitation of sound waves and internal waves, and, well, I like, well, the discussion about those points. But the question is, can we answer this question from the first principle? And unfortunately not, because we don't know, don't understand neither the physics of this uh, weakly collisional plasma well enough, and also we don't understand exactly, say, uh, uh, magnetic field and content of the bubbles well enough. But we can try to kind of uh, identify the conditions under which one of those mechanisms is uh, kind of dominating. I'm going to talk about those ones, but first let me comment on this one. Here is just simple hydro simulation of the uh, rising bubble. Uh, the, this is SPH, this is a fixed mesh, this is moving mesh, and the question is which is the correct simulation. Uh, there is just pure hydro, right? You start with the just uh, bubble, hot bubble, nothing more, no magnetic fields, nothing. And this is definitely wrong because, oh, kind of, there is spurious surface tension in SPH. This here, the, the uh, kind of, the bubble uh, is get disrupted. For the moving mesh, it is disrupted even quicker, but it doesn't mean that any of those simulation is correct because we just, there must be magnetic fields, there are, must be viscosity, and we actually don't know. So we, we can do those simulations, but although we know that this is wrong from the point of view of hydrodynamic equations we are solving, but it might be actually closer to reality because of the magnetic fields and uh, uh, unknown viscosity. Oops. Yeah, so that, that's kind of uh, uh, unknown viscosity of the ICM. And that's example of a couple of simulations where people just put in uh, change in viscosity or uh, adding magnetic fields there. And you see that the everything changes depending on the assumptions. So we are not yet ready to answer this question from the first principles. But again, we can argue, uh, for example, talking about sound waves and internal waves, under what conditions the sound waves will dominate and under what conditions internal waves uh, dominate. I like those things because those are linear waves and therefore you can just do a lot of things just analytically. So if you have stratified atmosphere like our uh, Earth's atmosphere or something in ocean, well, and if it's compressive like our Earth's atmosphere, there are two kinds of waves which exist uh, uh, in the stratified atmosphere, and it's shown here. This is the wave number times the scale height. For our Earth, it's eight kilometers or so. For the clusters of galaxies, scale height typically is in the course 20 kiloparsec or so. And this is the, the uh, frequency divided by the Brunt-Vassala frequency, which is the buoyancy frequency. It's basically when we perturb small piece, it oscillates with this frequency. And those are just solutions. Uh, the, uh, there are just high frequency solutions, which are sound waves, slightly modified by the uh, presence of gravity. And this 
omega equal k times cs is just regular sound waves in a um, stratified fluid. So this is sound waves and there is also low frequency branch which is internal waves and it's just really crazy waves with the kind of group velocity and phase velocity perpendicular to each other. Well, but they are present and so you can just uh, sort of uh, watch it if you go to the pond, throw a pedal and you see, well, uh, kind of how waves are, those are surface waves but very close to the uh, internal waves. And you see that this is what happens if you just generate sound waves. Well, because this is high frequency branch, you do it quickly and just you change the volume. Increase, decrease, increase, decrease. That's the most efficient way of producing uh, waves. And in the case of internal waves, you just perturb in the gas like this, and then the waves are just, this is so-called Andrew Cross, they propagate at the angle uh, to the normal. Now the question, which of those actually uh, happen when the bubbles are rising in clusters or something is happening in uh, galaxy clusters? Uh, now let's look at observations first. This is again uh, the uh, Persons cluster, XA image, the supermassive black hole is here, those bubbles are here, and this is X-ray emission. And what will happen if you just uh, divide this image by spherical asymmetric model to highlight the perturbation you see in the gas? And you see the structure like this, and you see a lot of structures here. And the question is whether those are sound waves or internal waves, right? And so, sound waves. So this is kind of, again, the same picture, and this is simulation by uh, Matthew Shruskovsky uh, from 2004 showing what happens if you just release energy periodically and you see that while well, there are sound waves are propagating so it looks similar, right? Can we conclude that those ripples are really sound waves? Well, let's first look at the uh, internal waves. So here's my simulations. Uh, so uh, on top, this is simulations by the professionals who are doing just internal waves in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that this is a link, this is kind of Cartesian geometry, right? And so that those structures are internal waves, which are generated in kind of our atmosphere. Now what I did in my simulation, I just took this picture and just, just uh, converted it into something <laughs> spherical. And now you, you and then I replotted the Perseus image uh, in different colors. Well, you see that they also look like and the the characteristic feature of the internal waves that the radial wave number is much larger than the uh, perpendicular wave, wave number which means that there is long correlation lengths uh, in the horizontal direction and short correlation lengths in the vertical direction right and that's actually what we see here so what we see ripples is something which is long here and narrow in that direction so you see both things uh, work well now this means that, well, just based simple of, from images, we can't really tell. But we can just uh, do some simple simulations and ask ourselves how we are going to generate uh, sound waves, for example, by releasing energy into the, uh, from the AGN into the gas. The most efficient thing would be just inflate and deflate the bubble. That would be perfect acoustic system, which will uh, send sound waves very efficiently outside. The trouble is that we only inflate in bubbles. We are not deflating it, right? And that if you just look at the just simple dipole emission formula, kind of, if you keep inflating, the boundary of the bubble becoming, uh, moving slower and slower and slower, and in the efficiency of, uh, for the dipole radiation, there is a square of the second derivative for acceleration, so it's going to be very weak. Initially, it's effective, but then it's very weak. You can formally uh, kind of uh, make a simple uh, scenario. Uh, now it's not that peaceful. Make an explosion in the homogeneous medium. Let's assume that you have a medium with the pressure P, and then you're going to release the energy E over the time T uh, outburst. Okay, to kind of analyze this system, you first, what you can do, you can, and you release energy in the small region of space. First, you can determine the characteristic radius of a sphere uh, which contains s amount of thermal energy comparable to the uh, amount of energy outburst. 
this is Re, right? Re cube times P is of the order of energy you're going to release. Then you can divide this energy by the sound P of this medium and you get sound crossing time of this area. And then you can compare the duration of outburst to this characteristic time and this happens to be a key parameter. If this is much less than one, which means that the, the outburst is instantaneous, it's like exploding a bomb. If it's much larger than one, it's like peaceful inflation of the bubble. And then you can ask yourself, uh, let's consider kind of limiting case. In very long outburst, it's peaceful. You release energy so slowly that the uh, well, sound can propagate many, many times. And in this case, you don't produce any shock heating. You don't produce any sound waves. All you do is inflate a bubble and the enthalpy of the bubble is equal to the initial energy. That's the kind of picture. You release the energy, the, now the energy uh, inflate the bubble, and here is unperturbed gas. Now, in the opposite case, when there is instantaneous explosion, this is sidov taylor classical explosion, I take a bomb, explode it in a small space, then you drive very strong shock, and this shock dissipates the energy uh, when it propagates through the gas, but the, the kind of the debris of the explosion themselves, they are not occupying huge volume, they are just relatively modest. And what happens is that the rest of the gas gets shock heated. And this is shown here. You create small uh, uh, bubble, but then you just dissipate a lot of energy here. And uh, the, here, you just kind of summarizing, you can say that the bubble receives zero energy, but in order to calculate uh, how much energy went into the shock heating and potentially in the form of sound wave which propagate outwards, you have to do simple simulations. And you can do this, and for, in the case of spherical symmetry, the answer is very clear. So that here is again the ratio of the bubble uh, duration of the outburst to the uh, sound crossing time of the uh, bubble. Instantaneous outburst, very long outburst. And here's a partition of energy uh, which goes into either sound waves in shock heating or into the bubble enthalpy. The sum is one, right? And if you do everything slowly, all the energy goes into inflation of the bubble. If you do everything very quickly, all the energy actually goes into the shock heating. And the fraction of energy which goes into the sound waves always stay less than 12.5%. Even for the just instantaneous, even if I explode boom here. So most of the energy will be dissipated here. Only 12.5% 12, 12 will go out, right? No matter, so that that's the limit because once you drive very strong shock, it dissipates the energy right at the front of the shock. Well, only weak shock can propagate, uh, linear, sh uh, linear wave can propagate outwards. And if you just replace this simple spherical symmetric picture with the axisymmetric jet, then you can rise this fraction by a factor of two, roughly, and that was uh, shown by Bambic and Raylons. So that in order to, well, kind of, you know, that people who are just making acoustic system, they are just spending their lives in order to produce efficient acoustic system. And with AGN feedback, it's very difficult to make it very efficient. So 30%, that's the limit. And for spherical symmetric, I think this is 12.5%. Okay. So, which means that, it, and actually, if you look at the uh, real objects and try to determine those parameters, uh, those parameters for real objects, they are typically somewhere here. So, real objects always put most of the energy uh, into the uh, bubbles. Now, now you can say uh, that's uh, during the initial phase when the bubble is forming. What about uh, what happens when the bubble is rising? And let's assume that we have the bubble rising with the steady velocity. And then let's ask ourselves uh, which waves of those type can be excited by steadily moving bubble. Uh, uh, and well, if we are talking about linear waves, the excited linear waves should satisfy, of course, the dispersion relation, one thing. And the second thing, if we are considering steady picture, they should be stationary uh, in the frame of the moving body, which means that the uh, frequency should be equal k uh, uh, product uh, the 
u velocity. And combination of those two equations means that the velocity of the rising bubble should be larger than the phase velocity of the waves. Right? Otherwise, there is no solution. Now, it can be turbulence, but no linear waves. And so sound waves are not efficiently excited because typically kind of, uh, this condition is not satisfied, but internal waves, in principle, can be uh, excited. And uh, in order to analyze this deeper, you should look at the kind of uh, structures, uh, in, again, the Perseus cluster. Those are the fresh bubbles, which are just newly created. And this one is actually older bubble, which is already on the raising phase. And this one is the, uh, just the, another one on the opposite side. And you see the flattening of uh, the bubble. So there is some flattened structure, which somehow, maybe due to magnetic field, due to something, is able to maintain its shape, rather than just immediately dispersing into smaller uh, uh, bubbles. And it's rising, and it has the length to a uh, height ratio of the order of 4. And you can actually uh, calculate what kind of uh, uh, efficiency of the excitation of the uh, internal waves by such rising body by calculating the fruit number. The fruit number is just dimensional constant which is related, uh, which is relating the velocity of the body divided by the Brunfassala frequency, buoyancy frequency, the size of the body. And if this number is less than one, then there is a hope then, uh, that you can excite uh, internal waves efficiently. And Kind of, I'm not going to uh, go into details, but I can only say that if you just start with a spherical bubble, typically the fruit number is getting larger than one. So the, the spherical bubble, when it's rising, it's producing more likely turbulence in the wake rather than internal waves. But if you flatten the structure, the flattening of the structure means that you, you basically increase the area for the same volume, right? Which means that the drug, just normal iron dynamic drug is increasing, which means that the velocity drops. And once velocity drops, the fruit number is increasing, which means that you just uh, kind of becoming more and more efficient to the excitation of internal waves. That's what, how it happens. You consider flattening a bubble, it moves slower than the spherical bubble for the same vol volume, which means that the fruit number is becoming uh, less, that means that in addition to normal hydrodynamic drug, you uh, produce, you excite waves, which increases the drug, and now it's moved even slower, which means that you just, for the flatness structure, you immediately excite internal waves. And the kind of, the, in the simple simulation, you can immediately see that the flattened bubbles are moving slower. Uh, here, just the kind of uh, three bubbles uh, with different shapes. And those which are just flattened are moving slower. And you can kind of uh, convert this into the, uh, the drug coefficient, which is the, what people do in hydrodynamics do. This is drug coefficient is the just for, uh, force of the drug divided by the rho u squared a, right? This is normal hydrodynamic drug. The larger this coefficient is, the more kind of uh, efficient is the drug. And for the normal hydrodynamics, kind of not uncertified, you should be somewhere here, right? If you just consider flattened bubbles, they all have several times higher drug, which means that they have extra drug, which actually uh, associated with something. And this something is clearly internal waves. And what is shown here, here this is the body, flattened body moving in uncertified fluid, and this is typical potential flow around this body. And this is the same body moving in stratified fluid. And this, you see the structure, which somebody, uh, uh, some people call it herring bones, some people call it Christmas tree. Well, but those things are exactly the signature of internal waves. And if you want, I kind of, it's very similar to uh, the structures you can see uh, uh, around the ships or ducks you see, uh, just swimming in the lakes or oceans. And remarkable thing that, well, no matter whether it's big ship or a duck, well, the angle is the same and all properties are the same. And this is the same thing, so that it's, it's surface waves and there it's uh, kind of internal waves. But they all kind of satisfy uh, those uh, uh, kind of requirements to be stationary in the moving frame. 
And well, so which means that actually if we take uh, parameters of the bubbles just from observations, you do predict that internal waves are excited by rising bubbles on top of the high dynamic drugs. So high dynamic drugs, well, normal one, would be just, if the squared is zero, would be just turbulence in the wake, which eventually is going to be dissipated. But if you inci uh, uh, excite internal waves, they're going to propagate, but they don't propagate vertically, they propagate to the sides. And because of this specific uh, feature of clusters that the uh, brunt vassala frequency is decreasing function of radios, they're actually trapped in the core region and eventually are going to be dissipated. And in principle, kind of, you see that, that that's the velocity structure. This is square of the velocity, those images. In principle, observations might be able to kind of answer the question uh, uh, w whether the uh, internal waves are important or not, if we can actually measure the structure of the flow ahead of the rising bubbles. And this is the task for future, so that I would say that the kind of, in order to uh, resolve uh, all these problems with the sound in tone waves for good, what is missing is the measurements of the gas velocity. Well, we, one can predict the line broadening as a function of radius for the case of sound waves and internal waves, and the correlation lengths in the radial and tangential directions should be the, the uh, property which differentiate between the kind of uh, sound waves and internal waves. And of course, the measuring full velocity power spectrum would be also helpful. And in, say, X years from now, we, we can expect the next uh, Japanese observatory with cryogenic bolometers on space, which will provide some rough idea about this. And in, I don't know how many years, we can expect the Athena or Lynx next generation missions, uh, which will resolve everything by providing high resolution uh, energy picture. Okay, so that, that's the, the current status. As I said that, well, we are just, we are living in this area and fighting with each other. And so for 10 or 20 years, uh, we will keep fighting until it's resolved for good, which is okay. And uh, uh, just concluding, I would say that the agent feed feedback paradigm is robust. So we see evidence in many systems and kind of we see approximate balance between the AGN power and X-ray cooling losses. So if AGN is supplying not enough power, then it would have just huge observational consequences. We can kind of exclude this. If AGN mechanical power is larger than the X-ray cooling losses, the, there are just no big uh, trouble there because the thermal capacity of the entire cluster is much, much larger than what we are talking about. It's, well, the, the energy released in the core can kind of disperse uh, through the cluster. There will be just mild consequences. So the, uh, uh, the coupling efficiency uh, of the mechanical power with the gas is set by conservation law, and it's always high. But exact energy flow is unclear, but very interested it's interesting, but as I said, it's probably not crucial for the big picture. And it would be great to measure gas velocity. And I'm almost done. I'm just saying that, well, I stopped working on the jet feedback uh, a while ago because of the SRG mission, which is now in space. And I would like to just, as the last slide, show you this. That was half a month ago. This is SRG, which is supposed to map the entire sky in X-rays and provide, instead of ROSAT, provide the kind of uh, 20 or 30 times more sensitive map of the entire sky. And this is this kind of moment when we cover it roughly one uh, fix of the sky. It was months ago. By now, it's one third of the sky. By June, mid-June, mid we should cover the whole sky for the first time and then continue for four years doing this. And well, you can you can see a lot of objects uh, depending on your preference. Here is, for example, small patch close to the uh, nosocliptic pole. This is the Abel uh, uh, 2255. This is the QSO at redshift 0.7. There are just a huge number of just agents 
This is somewhere here is the Cygnus star forming region. And there was uh, just test scans here and you see bright emission here. This is roughly galactic plane. This is Cassiopeia A. This is Nos Polarspur and there are a lot of things to do. And that's what I'm going to do uh, tonight. Continue. Okay, and that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have questions, but I'll let the audience ask questions first. Who starts? Good to see you again. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, I have a question about work that you're probably familiar with since I think it was at MPA this was done, but it was Anderson and Sanyaev, where they took this UV spectrum yes. right at the, the edge of it. Yeah. Of, yeah, right at the edge. And they were suggesting that it's kind of a turbulent cascade through the gas for the coupling between the bubble and the hot gas. Yeah. So what do you make of that? Well, could be, but well, the, the trouble is that there is just, they used uh, kind of one or two spectra just kind of really exactly. going through. And I would say that this doesn't exclude other interpretations. So I'm not sure that, for example, they, when they're talking of filament, which consists of small droplets, I'm not sure that I agree with this, but it's possible. I, I can't kind of uh, say that it's, uh, this is incorrect. But so I see other possibilities as well. Just to follow on that, uh, what, what Matt just said, uh, um, there is that work of Zorableva where they have been measured the um, power spectrum of structures in X rays uh, uh, in several clusters, a lot of clusters, and they find the power low, which is consistent with the Kolmogorov spectrum yes. that extends to, to very high wave numbers. So it, it fits with this view? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think? Well, so that first about the Kolmogorov spectrum, uh, so yes, we do find something which is uh, consistent with Kolmogorov spectrum, but the dynamic range is 10. And I I if you talk to the, well, uh, in front of people who are just doing this classical hydrodynamics, and you're saying that you obtain Kolmogorov spectrum over the dynamic range of 10, they will tell you, well, I mean, you need well, three orders of, or six orders of magnitude to just say that that's Kolmogorov. So it's indeed consistent. And while well, the things which I uh, said about internal waves, the internal, there's a linear waves, right? They don't dissipate themselves, usually. They become non-linear, then they drive the turbulence, and then kind of uh, below the on scale smaller than admissive scale, where the kind of uh, uh, stratification is not important. There should be Kolmogorov spectrum, but really to prove that really Kolmogorov spectrum, yeah. we can't, we can't do it. Thanks so, so much uh, for this clear presentation. I am wondering about, uh, um, say, the title and perhaps your conclusions in the following sense, very shortly. If this, of course, AGN uh, feedback, you said, I mean, it's robust pr paradigm. You present some uh, equation to, to describe. So um, the point is that uh, it could not be an a, a huge amount of models given the right uh, answers. All the, I mean, among these models, it should be a class of model, unfortunately one, which is the correct, from a more uh, well-posed theory, fundamental, from kinetic, for instance, kinetic theory, and uh, also more constrained by observations. I see here, I mean, uh, it's very good one part of the, of the equations. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the other about the efficiency, as you show, is it cannot be possible. So we cannot, we cannot, from the point of view said of the physics of the fundamental astrophysics, be 
uh, saying that successful. So it's not so successful, that uh, is not. And the other point is uh, angular momentum, perhaps, of the source of the... Um, I am a little surprised that the uh, source, the black hole, I mean, which is so huge, or the big galaxies, mm -hmm. are not playing a more, uh, a more direct role in your, say, the half past, I mean, your last descriptions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I agree with everything you have said. Uh, so I put uh, the block, black hole leaves its own life. It doesn't care about clusters at all. It only cares about what is falling onto the black hole, right? But it affects the surroundings. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but by itself, it just doesn't care about whether the cluster is cooling or not cooling. Right? And this is separate, absolutely just, to, yeah. But this is a big separate topic, and well, and unfortunately there are many uh, still unknowns there. But then you, yeah, yeah. you cannot be so successful. Yeah, 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 yeah. well, th this is what, what okay. people say, that this is kind of realistic, uh, successful models. Well, they are just, what, what I'm saying, that they all share the success in terms uh, of dissipating the power in the right place. But of course, they are, they are all incomplete, and I, I agree with you. So may, maybe you could discuss this later, because we have other questions. I'm sorry, but... It's a very short question. You, you mentioned the importance of X-rays in, in your model. Are you able to uh, introduce a polarization effect, even in an X-ray domain? Polarization is very important, because you are following all, all the ingredients, and uh, the question yeah. is, are you able to do that? Uh, the polar I, I completely agree about polarization in X-ray domain, yeah. and well, as you know, next year, uh, IXP, the Nasser polarimeter, is going to fly. Uh, these X-rays, those X-rays, th those are mostly uh, uh, Sommel Bramstrong, right, and mostly unpolarized. But just last year we also wrote a uh, paper because this is weakly collisional plasma and it's possible that the distribution function of electrons can be anisotropic because of the just stretching magnetic field lines. And then suddenly, just from the pure thermal Bramstrong, you get polarization. The effects are, well, small, like 10 to the minus 8, something. But, I mean, in 100 years from now, kind of, it's might be possible to measure, but I, I absolutely agree. So far, well, I'm sure that the dominant flux is unpolarized. But what is more important is in the kind of, we were discussing with students here, the uh, scattering of X-rays from our galactic center black hole. And there the Thomson scattering leads to very, very strong polarization. And there you can actually use this polarization in order to infer uh, a lot of things. And that's what we're going to do next year. Yeah, I have a more practical question about your last slide and the Erosita data. Yeah. So far I know or understand the data are not public immediately. So what is the plan of releasing the Erosita data? Well, there is clear plan to eventually release the data. <laughs> that, yes, absolutely. So that, what, what does it mean eventually depends on how easy and good uh, it's going to be. Because, so you know that this is, for example, this uh, this slide shows the, the part, well, uh, the Russian, so I have access to half of the sky. That's the sky division. So that, you know, I, I just rotated the sphere in such a way that you can't see the other side because it's black. So that, <laughs> well, yeah, so that, and uh, uh, there are different uh, policies in uh, German consortium and Russian consortium. So that German consortium, they say something about two years, but after the uh, calibration and everything is understood, which nobody knows how long it will take. But, but you Russian work on, in both countries, so you get access to all the data, no, don't you? No, no, it's, it's not possible, so that, well, you have to choose. Oh. <laughs> okay, it's like a passport. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> so, I'm not familiar with the field, but uh, all the obsessional data you have shown so are based on the uh, X-ray. So 
is no thing to get from other spectral range because you speak about the velocity of the gas. Yes. So it's not easy. So it's not something to get from other spectral range. Well, so that in principle, uh, I'm talking about X-rays because most of the gas is actually in clusters is hot, and th that's exactly this gas which is losing energy. So that this is our prime kind of target. But of course, uh, in the cores there are often filaments of H alpha emitting filaments, and people are using uh, the uh, just uh, optical spectroscopy in order to study them. And there are two possibilities. Either those two components are linked and they just basically share the same velocity field, or they are just decoupled and therefore you, you can't, for example, judge from uh, H alpha about X-rays. And so far, kind of, uh, I would prefer to have clear velocity measurement from X-rays because then it's just direct and unambiguous. But you are absolutely right that uh, a lot of things are just, and Muse is now doing a great job in mapping the uh, spectral lines in the cores of the clusters and then doing dynamics. What we know from this, this is not just simple ballistic motions, this is just much more complicated. Yeah, and absolutely, this is the area where I would expect a lot of progress uh, in the coming years. Uh, in the case, uh, case of uh, short uh, uh, turbulence time, uh, the dissipation of energy, is, uh, as you, uh, you described, uh, is very local. Yes. Therefore, therefore uh, a priori, if dissipation, uh, uh, we, have to, we have to be able to see sort of knots of very bright spots in a, for instance, in a cluster. Can it be used for, I don't know, if the, if the resolution of, the, of images are, uh, are enough uh, to distinguish sort of knotty emission uh, to be yes. able to distinguish between various, various processes that yes. you uh, described and where they happen and yes. so on? This is actually an interesting question for two reasons. Suppose that dissipation time is extremely short. This means that you increase the just energy or uh, entropy of the gas here, which means that it expands. It's becoming low density, higher temperature but low density, and therefore it's, it looks like just lack of emission on top of the rest of the gas, right? Instead of being bright and hot, it's actually dim and hot, right? This is yeah, yeah, but so this, is, this, this is one thing, so that it's difficult to observe lower density hot regions because they are just they're less visible than the, the colder. Thing. This is one thing. The other thing that once you just uh, make it uh, high entropy, it itself will start moving, right? And it will just, like in our atmosphere, it will try to move until the uh, level where the entropy matches this level. Then it will oscillate a bit and then spread. Right? which means that the, their lifetime will be set by the convective lifetime. Yeah, so, and there is no, well, th that's kind of theory, which I think we both agree with, but what is the reality, we don't know yet. We want velocities. Yeah, then we, we probably no, can. Better, better yeah, the only thing I can tell you that when we were trying to just actually uh, we were doing a lot of things with the trying to infer uh, character of the oh, ah, here it is uh, Okay, th that's the Perseus cluster, again, ripples. And what you can try to do, you, you can just ask whether the uh, variations of uh, uh, density and uh, temperature are anti-correlated. And to do this, yeah, you can actually predict, you can make just combination of images which shows what will happen if the, those perturbations have isobaric equation of state, so cooler, denser, or adiabatic, so denser and hotter. This thing, well, 
I'm just removing the, the shocks. And now I'm going to remove isobaric fluctuations. You see, just, we know that the, most of the fluctuations are isobaric, right? Which, in principle, can be consistent with what you are saying, right? But, uh, so that, uh, what we know that they are not kind of only few structures are adiabatic. Uh, oops. Yeah. Like this. Yeah, but, well, we, we can talk about this uh, separately. Thank you very much, then. Thank, Thank you. you for coming.